In this video, we're going to cover substitution. Remember, when you take derivatives, there are rules. There's linearity, the product rule, the chain rule. And for antiderivatives, we only have linearity so far. So today, we're essentially going to do the chain rule backwards. Chain rule is for derivatives. Substitution is for antiderivatives. Substitution is essentially the chain rule backwards. Remember that the chain rule is a method for taking derivatives of a composition of functions. One function is plugged into the other function, and in order to take the derivative of that quantity, we use the chain rule. Now, of course, calculus two is about taking antiderivatives. So let's write down the antiderivative version of the chain rule. It's called substitution. Now, if the derivative of f of g of x is equal to the chain rule formula, that means that the antiderivative of the chain rule formula is equal equal to f of g of x. And don't forget plus c. Now this formula is a little complicated. You have the derivative of f composed with g times the derivative of g. What are the chances that a quantity will look exactly like this? Well, matching up some quantity with this long formula is the challenge of substitution. In order to make that challenge a bit easier, we introduce some notation. Now suppose that I had a quantity which was a bit long and just happen to be of the exact format f prime of g of x times g prime. What am I looking for in order for a quantity to be of this format? The g function itself should be composed inside some other function and the derivative of g should appear on the outside. So we sometimes call g the inside function. When you're doing substitution, one of your primary jobs at the beginning of the problem is to identify what is the inside function? What is the g function? You're looking for a function that's composed inside something else whose derivative also appears on the outside of the problem. Now once you identify what the inside function is, we will set u equal to the inside function, g of x. Now if g is a function of x, then u is also a function of x. So if we take the derivative of u with respect to x, that will give us the derivative of g. Now when we're doing antiderivatives, we use a slightly different notation. We multiply both sides of this equation times dx. So we would write du is equal to g prime of x dx. The reason that we're introducing u and du is in order to plug into the original problem. In order to figure out a substitution problem, I have to translate everything into u notation. The g of x will get replaced by u, and the g prime dx will get replaced by du. Once you substitute the u in, you should get get a vastly simpler problem. We would take the antiderivative of f prime with respect to u in order to get f. Don't forget the plus c. And then the final step at the end of every substitution problem is don't forget to put the x's back in. So u is equal to g of x plus c. Now you can see how we do substitution. We essentially go through step by step, putting u in, taking the antiderivative, putting x back in, and that is is the step-by-step -step way of doing this substitution formula. Let's do some examples. Let's take the antiderivative of 3x squared times cosine of x cubed. As you can see, there's a function on the inside here, x cubed, and the derivative of x cubed appears as well. Haha, -ha, we figured it out. Our u function should be x cubed. The relationship between u and x is that u is equal to x cubed. We have to take the derivative, write things down step by step. du is equal to 3x squared times dx. Now in order to make the substitution, what we will do is use some very basic algebra, which is to remember that you can multiply in any order. 3x squared times cosine x cubed is the same thing as cosine x cubed times 3x squared. So let's plug in these substitutions. Everywhere I see an x cubed, I'm going to replace it with a u. And 3x squared times dx, that whole quantity is going to be equal to du. Notice that I've reduced the problem to being super simple. The antiderivative of cosine of u with respect to u. That is a very reasonable problem. We get sine of u plus c, and the final step is to put the x's back in. u is equal to x cubed here, so I get sine of x cubed plus c. Let's do another problem. Of course this is a substitution problem because this video is about substitution, but we need to have strategies for later. How do I know this is a substitution problem? 
problem. The key is that there's composition. Composed inside the E is x squared plus 4x. This is an indicator that perhaps substitution is the correct method. You'll have to determine this more and more as we go through the course. Now, remember that our inside function should have its own derivative on the outside. Let's just calculate it and see how things go. The inside function here is x squared plus 4x. Taking the derivative gives me 2x plus 4 times dx. And now we can ask ourselves the question, is the derivative of the inside function appearing also in the problem? Well, sort of. This one says x plus 2, and this one says 2x plus 4. If I take my du formula and simply divide by 2 on both sides, I get a half du is equal to x plus 2 dx. It's not exactly du that appears in my problem. It's a half du that's appearing in my problem. By the way, you can call this a dictionary because it's a way of translating in between the x variable and the u variable. I like to rearrange problems using algebra so that the problem looks easier to me. The exponential on the left and the x plus 2 on the right sort of makes more sense because then I can match it up with my dictionary here. Okay, so our next step is to plug in the u variable. x squared plus 4 should be replaced by u, so we get e to the u. And now x plus 2 dx, that is not equal to du. du is equal to 2x plus 4 times dx. x plus 2 times dx is equal to a half times du. Okay, now we have a vastly simpler problem. We can take that one half out of the integral and we're left with the antiderivative of e to the u with respect to u, so we get e to the u. Finally, don't forget to add the plus c. The final step is to put the x's back into the problem. Our u is equal to x squared plus 4x. On the top of the slide, you can see here I have derivatives of trig functions. You might remember from Calculus 1 that in order to obtain these derivatives, you had to apply the quotient rule. Tangent is equal to sine over cosine. So if I apply the quotient rule to sine over cosine and then I do some simplifying, I will get secant squared for the derivative. Similarly for secant, secant is equal to 1 over cosine. If I apply either the chain rule or the quotient rule and do some simplifying, once I take the derivative, I will get secant times tangent. You should be able to check all of these formulas yourself using the definitions of each one of the trig functions in terms of sine and cosine and either the chain rule or the quotient rule, whatever is appropriate for that problem. Now that we're thinking about antiderivatives, I expect that you know these four derivatives back and forth. Now here's a question that I want to address on the next slide. Can you think of a function whose derivative is equal to tangent? If the only thing you know is calculus 1 material. As you can see, none of these functions have a derivative equal to tangent. Okay, there's a tangent here, but this tangent is multiplied times secant x, so that one doesn't work. I'm looking for a function whose derivative is just tangent by itself. It turns out, in order to take the antiderivative of just tangent by itself, this is actually a substitution problem. The first trick is to write tangent as sine over cosine. Now we have a function composed in the denominator down here here, that's 1 over cosine, and the derivative of cosine is also appearing in the problem. This is a standard substitution problem with u equal to cosine. We must be a bit careful here. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. Now negative sine is not exactly appearing in our problem. We have positive sine. So let's multiply by a negative 1 on both sides to obtain negative du is equal to sine of x dx. Now this problem can be written as 1 over cosine multiplied times sine dx. Now in our u notation, this is 1 over u because u is equal to cosine and sine x dx is equal to negative du. As you can see, the problem is getting simpler. Let's pull out the negative sign, take the antiderivative to get ln of absolute value of u plus c, and finally put the x's back in. The first step of this problem is a strategy that you'll want to keep in mind, which is to write everything in terms of sines and cosines. Keep that in mind because 
because it's a good trick that you can use on other problems. The other thing to notice is that one over cosine, you might not think that that's a composition of functions, but it is a composition of functions. The outside function is the one over function, and the inside function is the cosine. So it turns out that any time you have something in the denominator, the denominator is always composed inside the one over function. So if you're looking for the inside function, consider the denominator. I recommend that you know this entire process for the tangent function. Tangent is a basic function. We should know how to take both its derivative and its antiderivative in this class. So this problem is very important. You can either understand the strategy for how to derive every single step, or it's your choice. You could also memorize that the antiderivative of tangent is negative ln of absolute value of cosine. The risk with memorizing is that you might forget or you might mess it up. I prefer understanding every step of the problem because it also helps me figure out other problems when my understanding is good of the basics. Let's do one more problem. Oh no, I had some technical problem where I lost all my audio. So for this slide, I'm going to slowly reveal to you what the solutions are with these boxes. Okay, so here's our example. Cosecant squared of 3x divided by the quantity 1 plus cotangent squared 3x. I'm looking for a function that is composed inside something else where its derivative also appears in the problem. So we've got cotangents and cosecants here. So let's think about the derivatives of cotangent and cosecant. The derivative of cosecant is cosecant multiplied times cotangent. U equals cosecant is not going to work because although cosecant appears here, its derivative of cosecant multiplied times cotangent does not appear in this problem. Alrighty, so let's think about something else. Maybe our u should be equal to the cotangent. Let's think about would that work. So using the chain rule for the du, cosecant squared does appear in our problem. Sure, there's an extra 3 and an extra minus sign, but we can take care of those on the next line by dividing by them on both sides. Multiplying by negative a third on both sides of the equation, we find that cosecant squared of 3x times dx, this thing times that thing, is equal to negative one third du. As usual, I'll use a bit of algebra in order to rearrange the problem. Moving this cosecant squared over to the side in order to multiply times the dx, because remember we can multiply in any order, that leaves a one for the numerator. Now I can put my u quantities in. The cotangent by itself is the u. So in the denominator here, we have one plus u squared. And like we just talked about, cosecant squared of 3x times dx, that whole quantity is equal to negative one-third du. Now this is a completely reasonable problem. We will pull the minus one-third out in front, and then taking the antiderivative, we get arctan, and then putting the x's back in, we have negative a third arctan of cotangent of 3x. And that's the solution to the problem. I hope you enjoyed this video. As you can see, substitution problems can get pretty challenging pretty fast. You really want to make sure you get this method down solid because we're going to be using it for the rest of the semester. Don't forget to challenge yourself, look for extra problems in the book, and we'll see you in class.